Hello everyone. Welcome to the 45th webinar in 12 Ds training webinar series. My name is Lisa Stewart and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator here at 12D Solutions. 12D's training webinars showcase common industry challenges, taking a close look at industry best practices and how these can be implemented using 12D products. The aim of these webinars is to upskill 12D users and broaden their understanding of the capabilities of 12D products. We run these webinars regularly and record them for posting through our website and on YouTube. The first 44 webinars from this training series, as well as the 41 webinars from our Industry Solutions series, are available on our YouTube channels if you missed those. While we wait for everyone to finish joining and get comfortable, I'll launch a couple of polling questions. Firstly, you'll have about 30 seconds to answer about whether you were aware that 12D model had clash detection capabilities, and then I'll show the results. Okay, it looks like most people were aware, but we've got a few people coming along um, to see what all this is about, so welcome everyone. Up next, I'd like to ask, have you been using TriMesh objects inside 12D model? You'll have about 30 seconds to answer again, and then I'll show the results. Okay, it looks like most people haven't been using these yet, so I'm sure everyone's going to get a lot out of today's webinar. During today's live presentation, you'll be able to type your questions along the way. We'll put some instructions on the screen. We'll answer as many as possible of those throughout the webinar, and at the end I'll read out some of your questions to the presenter for his insights if there's time. Today's webinar, Drainage and Object 3D Clash Detection, will be presented by Dylan Ravel, a region se regional sales manager for 12DNZ with over 17 years of experience in civil engineering practice, land development, drainage and construction. Not only does 12D model allow its users to create comprehensive 3D and BIM models of surveys, road designs and water modeling, it also provides tools for users to analyze and check the effect of these models spatially against one another. This webinar will cover tools for users to visually identify, report and process 3D model interference or clash occurrences for tins, strings and trimesh objects. Over to you, Tylan. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you for that introduction and welcome everybody. Um, today's training overview, uh, we're going to do a 12D model object analysis uh, or clash detection as, it more common, uh, as it's more commonly known. Um, I'm going to demonstrate some old and some not so old features in 12D model uh, to aid determining spatial model conflicts or 3D clash detection. So topics covered today in today's webinar, um, 12D model elements, we'll just do a bit of a review on the different types of elements or strings inside 12D um, that can be used for the 3D clash detection. These will include drainage strings, uh, super strings, tins and dry mesh objects creating and converting 12D objects into these particular types, spatial conflicts, i.e. clash detection methods, and vertical separation intersecting objects in 3D clash reporting tools. So on to the 12D model elements. The first up is the super strings. It's the most common string that's used in 12D, um, and it has a number of uses. It has a spatial position, i.e. it has a horizontal and a vertical position uh, that can be used for uh, the um, uh, 3D clash detection. There's no linked or attached structures, i.e. pits or chambers. You can have unlimited attributes on each vertex segment and string, and this is very handy for your BIM workflow, and also passing these across and checking them versus a federated model. They have a size or a mass, and this is defined by uh, diameters, either it's a pipe or it can be a width and a height as a culvert. It's used for modelling services, ducts, piles, clearance corridor, and clearance corridors most typically. So just to give you a little bit of an overview, I'm just going to flip into 12D, and majority of my uh, training is going to be done live. Um, I'm not a very big fan of PowerPoint, so we'll try and get as much as we possibly can. So I've just got a, some typical 12D elements here, uh, and on the screen on the lower left-hand side, I've got an orange line, which is just a 12D super string. The string uh, has no uh, or mass or size at the moment, it's just a typical string, and it's commonly used for uh, identifying and for service clash checks or modelling services or services corridors. 
Even if it's a 2D string, it doesn't have to be 3D to start off with, uh, there's functionality within 12D to easily give that um, a vertical geometry, and the most common one of, way of doing that is from a tin. So I'm just going to take that uh, surface to string, and I'm just going to drape that string onto a 12D tin, everything in that model. I'm going to drape it onto a super string, and I'm actually going to drop it half a metre below that super tin, uh, and that will give it some uh, relevant vertical geometry. So if I just drape that string and finish, you'll see that that's dropped slightly lower than it was before, and it has no size or shape, and if I'd like to take a model of strings or a whole view of strings and give them some mass, either a pipe or a culvert, that I can be used in my 3D clash analysis, um, it's a property of the super string. So within 12D, under the super strings, you can actually add those properties or remove those properties via the super strings pipe option. So I'm going to take everything in that model. Uh, the levels or the Z values that are currently on the string, I'm going to set as the obvert of the shape itself. And as I said, you can apply a pipe or a culvert. So a pipe is just a single diameter, or a culvert is a width and a height, um, which is commonly used for uh, trench analysis. And I'm going to set uh, the constant value a diameter of 0 0.1 on the string, and we'll use that later on in our clash analysis. So if I just hit change on that one, you'll see that it's actually changed to a 3D shape or 3D object. And if I just make sure on my section view that I have all the on, you can see those visually in the section view of this particular drainage string that I'm having. Now onto drainage strings. There's another one of our 12D model elements. Drainage strings. So drainage strings also have a spatial position. They do have attached structures, i.e. pits, so you can have uh, different pit shapes within the drainage string itself, uh, which give it a 3D clearance value. They also can have unlimited attributes on each pit, pipe and string. And they have a size and mass, and that size and mass is defined by the pipe shapes or sizes, and the pit shapes and sizes, and the pipes and the pits can also have wall thicknesses, which are included in the spatial conflict. Trimesh objects can be linked to these drainage strings via the drainage.4D file and a 12DA file, and I'll demonstrate how that's done. And class checking features for the drainage strings are included inside the drainage network editor. So if we just go back to 12D, and we'll have a look at a stormwater, and just load a position through here just to give you an indication of the drainage strings and the drainage shapes. Uh, we have pit sizes and pipe sizes, and you can see there we also have wall thicknesses included and wall thicknesses on the pits themselves. These are defined within the drainage.4D and the drainage network editor. So if I go and edit this particular drainage network editor, we can look at the pit details. and this can have a diameter or diameter, uh, sorry, a length and a width to make it a rectangular or a square object. And this is one in particular in the range stop 40 file allows me to basically free replace or free size this object itself. So if I apply that, what was a 0 0.93 diameter is now taken to zero diameter, so it has no structure there at all. We've introduced the ability to link trimesh objects to the drainage, dot board, uh, drainage element. So if I just quickly fire up a different position, you can see the drainage string that has a pit and the pipe, and it also has the, those objects linked, and they're linked via the actual pit type. So within the drainage dot 40 file, These are a particular type of pit called the RD pit. And you'll see under the RD pit definition, um, it not only has a rectangular size for the um, pit itself, but we can attach or reference or link a trimesh object to those. And the trimesh object is linked via a 12DA or a 12DAZ file. In this particular case, it's found inside the library. And this is loaded as an example uh, with 12D version 12. So we have um, trimesh objects that have particular names inside the 12DA file, and I'll just read that 12DA file in just to give you an idea of how that's done. So if I just open up the library, it's within the drainage subfolder, and within the drainage subfolder we have some 12DA files which contain these objects. So I'll just drag and drag 
drop that into a particular view and so it's been the easiest way to um, control those objects and the positioning of the objects is obviously via models and the positioning of the actual model itself is down referenced around uh, coordinate zero zero and the coordinate zero zero is automatically linked by the set out point within the drainage um, dot 4D or the, the drainage network editor. A bit hard to see what those are at the moment. If I open up a perspective open gel view and just turn on some of those road pits and the road grate because we've got two tri-mesh objects that are attached via this drainage dot 4D file. Shade those up to give them a little bit of definition. You can see those two particular models that are referenced in the drainage.4D file and they're referenced by the trimesh name. So on the left hand side we have a trimesh name within that 12DA file called little 2400 LHS and I do a string inquire on that particular lintel. You'll see the name matches the name definition inside the drainage.4D file and the grate also matches the grate definition. And that's how they're linked or referenced inside the drainage.4D file so we can see them as 3D objects inside 12D. Let's minimise that file. So what we're seeing in this current perspective view on the left hand side is our drainage network that fits in the pipes and the linked trimesh objects from the 12DA file. These aren't actually objects at the moment, they're not selectable, so when it comes to including those in our spatial collision or spatial conflicts or 3D clash detection, um, we need to actually convert those into uh, 3D trimeshes that are placed within the 12D database. Now whether it's a, a linked thing from the drainage.4D or it might be a 12D visualisation object that you've brought in, uh, be a street light or a fence line or a guardrail or something like that, we have lots of different options in 12D to create these things as real trimesh elements that can be used. So I'm just going to quickly go into strings, trimesh, under create, I'll tear off this above menu, and if I look under the create options, we have a create trimeshes from 12D objects, and it's just a really quick and easy way to take things that are familiar with 12D users and and create them as objects that can obviously be passed across to your BIM and your federated model. So I'm going to convert everything within the Stormwater network, um, convert the trimesh objects, and I'm going to create a new model called TriSWPITS. So if I generate those, that's gone and generated not only the linked objects, but also all of the pits and pipes as ACMESH objects. So I'll turn off these models here, just to give you an indication. If I turn on that new model that was created by converting the trimesh objects, you can see we've essentially got exactly as what we had before, and trimesh, but these are now objects that are placed into 12D in their own model, they're selectable, and you can see in a particular feature which is quite nice when you're converting drainage um, trimesh objects into 12D, it not only has the name of the trimesh but it also puts the reference or the pit name or the pipe name from it. Now when it comes to the um, clash detection, I've already got all these pits and pipes in a 12D drainage string, so I'm not going to be needing those. So I'm just going to quickly go and remove all of those pits and pipes and just leave the trimesh objects for later on in the detection. Just going to read a layout file in here. And I'm just running a utilities A to G delete. But in this particular case, I'm using a name mask to do a filter selection. I'm going to select absolutely everything inside that model that's been converted to 12D objects. But under the not item here, I'm not going to include anything that has the name mask LIL. So if I go and filter select all of those, and then just delete those unwanted options, and what I'm going to be left with is just those converted trimesh objects, which, we, as I say, we'll use later on inside our now, clash analysis. So about trimesh objects, they're the third of the elements we're going to discuss today. We did just discuss the drainage strings and the trimesh objects. They have a spatial position as well. Uh, the object itself defines all its shapes and the purpose rather than just having a hard and fast purpose like drainage pits and pipes. You can have unlimited attributes on an object, which again is very uh, useful for your BIM workflows. 
It has a size and mass. It can be a closed object, uh, i.e. solid. It can be an open object. It might be an open trench. It can be a planar object, which is almost replicating like a surface or a um, maybe a cut and fill slope. It doesn't have any depth. It's just purely planar. And if it does have um, solid or volumes or mass, then we can obviously get volumes from it. Trimeshes can be created using different static or dynamic options. I'm going to show you a few of the static options today that can be used. And they can be used in the 3D clash detection inside 12D model. So just having a look at some of those static options, um, we've converted those 12D objects to trimesh, but it might be something that's starting off a little bit simpler. An excellent... Excuse me, I will just turn off those objects. An excellent option and something that's familiar to uh, the majority of 12D users is the concept of a tin. Now tin is essentially just a surface, it doesn't have any depth. Uh, we have options within 12D to create tri-meshes from tins. And so I'm going to create a tri-mesh from a 12D tin um, design. I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to create a new model called Tri-Tin Design, but I can actually give it a depth. I'm going to give it a depth of uh, 0 0.6, and this is, could be used very, very uh, handily or very quickly for checking whether your drainage strings are within a minimum depth profile from a particular surface. So I'll just go and create that, and I'll go and turn on that new model that was created. You can see that it's created a tri-mesh directly from a 12D tin, a little bit. You can see how it's now given it a depth value, so it's essentially a mass or a solid. Because I've turned that model on, we can see where some of our other 12D drainage objects start to penetrate through the tri-mesh, and we'll uh, isolate those later on. Uh, but it'd be really nice if I can see any objects that are underneath that tri-mesh as well. So we give you the ability, like anything in 12D, to apply blending or transparency value for that. So if I apply a blend to that tri-mesh, um, anywhere between 0 and 1, I'm going to make that 50% transparent. And if I apply that and just redraw the view, now I can see all of those other uh, 12D objects that are underneath or concealed by that tri-mesh. And just out of matter of uh, interest or a tip for everybody, uh, if you're wanting to see a blending value through a tri-mesh, then that tri-mesh has to be the last thing drawn in 12D, so you'll need to control that by the model order. So that's creating a static tri-mesh object from a tin. When we start having a look at some other ways of creating tri-mesh objects, if I just have a look at my clash tri-mesh, I've got essentially a 3D string here, and it's just a 3D polygon that's been drawn by CAD, and I have another polygon which is just inside that, which is going to give me or allow me to um, put in essentially a shape or a thickness of that object. And I can um, attach those inner and, inner and outer polygons via the CAD holes option. If you're not familiar with that, it's under the CAD options where you can add holes within a thing for fills and most importantly tri-meshes now. So I'm going to actually create a tri-mesh object simply from those polygons. So I'm going to create a tri-mesh object from this outer polygon. Uh, um, it's got a name and I'm going to produce it with a model and I can do things with regards to especially depth. I'm going to make a Z offset from that outer chamber of 50 mil, so it points essentially just above the uh, level of the tin itself, and I'm going to give it a corresponding depth of one meter down. If you are including holes in the polygons, uh, we can create separate models and names for those, and I'm essentially going to use this option of holes to quasi produce a lid. So the Z offset of that lid is going to be 150 millimetres above the actual height of the string, and I'm going to give it a 200 mil depth below that. So if I generate that tri-mesh from the polygon option, and go on and turn on, on the first of those models, the tri-mesh chamber, if I shade that up, just to give it a little bit of perspective, you can see from that outer polygon and the inner polygon, it's created a solid object um, that can be used in tri-mesh and passed across to all of them objects. You've got the inner poly polygon or the inner tri-mesh that's been created from the hole. That basically sits within that and 100 millimeters higher. 
Now if I just remove that outside chamber, you can see where the 0.2 depth value has been included in that. So I'm creating almost a lid. If we want to get into something a little bit more complex than just a simple polygon, we can actually create them from planar polygons as well. Right, open up that Stormwater Tri Mesh and just go and have a look at some head wall areas. I have a model of uh, polygons that are in 3D and they're in a model called SW Headwall. And you can see on the screen there that that's a number of polygons that I'm going to make and join together to make a solid 3D object. So from the tri mesh I can create from planar polygons. And if I choose everything in that SW Headwall option, I'm going to create a new tri mesh and a new tri mesh model called SW. When I turn that model on, you can see that I've created a 3D tri-mesh object from those planar polygons uh, in a head wall shape, and that shape and size has been defined by me. Now something that's come into the life cycle of version 12 that you may or may not be aware of, if you want to, uh, as, as a drainage designer, automatically put those 3D tri-mesh objects onto your drainage um, positions. Under Design Drainage Sewer, the Create option, we now have an option called Create Culvert Headwalls, which uh, is a quick and easy way to create culverts, which will be defined either by uh, set parameters or within attribute parameters inside the drainage.4D file. So you can actually specify your local territorial authority or your local manufacturer's size for your headwalls. Um, don't be afraid to ask on support or on the forum on that option and I'm sure we'll show that at a different time. So those are pretty simple tri-mesh object structures that we've got, and you may be sharing these solid models or tri-mesh models from different uh, software sources. Uh, when it comes to doing my class check analysis with regards to drainage and some footings, I've just got all those footings from some I IFC data that's been brought in, and yes, I know it's getting a massive building on a small subdivision, but it'll give you an idea, and this is one of the ones that we have in our library that we use within our training. So this is a number of models defined by the P sets in the IFC file. Now there's some great YouTube videos on our IFC. Uh, importing and importing, exporting, and our BIM workflow that you can find it on our YouTube website. So we'll isolate later on, just to do our clash analysis. I just turn off all of the IFC models apart from the IFC footing. You can see these are the trimesh objects that I'm left with that we're going to be looking at a little later on when we come to our spatial conflicts. So that's come in from a third-party software, and with the tri meshes, there's a lot of dynamic options in 12D. Uh, we have a pavement attribute manager for designers of um, roads or retaining walls or anything like that that can um, uh, very easily and very quickly create dynamic tri meshes, i.e. if the design changes, then the tri meshes update. So we'll see over the next probably um, six months to two years, a lot of people will be starting to build not only just their strings and sections, which is a normal 12D designer's lot, uh, we can have something a little bit more um, substantial. And sorry, I'm just looking for a view. That view's not there. That's popped off. Uh, that's right, I'll create a brand new view. Always have to have some technical issues as we go through. And I'll just turn on a number of models. I'll turn on all of those. And this is the sort of output that we will probably be expecting, or those uh, uh, 12D modelers who are involved in uh, BIM projects would be expected to provide. So
you can see we've got a number of elements there within the particular job. We've got Sapin or at the technical um, uh, technical forum, technical conference. You'll be seeing some options within 12. be that can uh, allow our users to create those logs. You can see what sort of output that uh, 12B model can provide in dynamic options. I look at this other trimesh or complex object that's been brought in from another third party software. Quite often you'll find that you'll have the, um, uh, the, the problem, let's say, of a lot of these objects from third party software being in the wrong place. Uh, probably around coordinate zero, 0, so I just wanted to show you and make you aware of the options in 12D that we can transform those 3D trimeshes and put them in the right um, world coordinates, as it were. Uh, one of the common ways of doing those is doing a 3D helmet, and this is just a 3D transformation of normal strings, uh, 2D strings or 3D trimeshes, so I'm just going to read in the helmet definition file here. Just make sure that I'm transforming the correct data. And all a 3D helmet is, is it takes a real world coordinate, easting, northing, and elevation, and matches that with the actual model coordinate, the easting and the northing. And it gives us the ability to pick up that whole 3D model format and flip it into the right world space. So you see that that's disappeared from that particular view. If I come back to this view here and turn on that corresponding model, you'll see that that's put that complex trimesh model, which we can use for our 3D clash detection in the right world coordinates, so it'll be corresponding with our drainage and our other strings. Okay, so I've been doing a lot of talking about this 3D clash detection, but we'll start, flip back to the PowerPoint and have a look at some of these options within 12D to look at spatial conflicts. So first up, we're going to have a look at the drainage clash checks. This is uh, one of the older options inside 12D. This is run from the drainage network editor, or the network editor as it were. It checks vertical separation of strings by crossing services, and it checks super strings and drainage strings, uh, or the combination of both in models. It reports these clashes in the output window. And it gives you smart lines in the output window, which uh, gives you the ability to auto pan the plan and the section view if you're in the network editor um, to see where those conflicts actually are. So if I look at my my services plan view to start off with. We'll just have a little bit of a look at the service clash option within the network editor. So by activating the drainage network and loading up that drainage network, the service clash is set within 12D in the network editor under the global utility models. And we have the ability to specify a service clash file. And the service clash files are rather easy to implement or create, they're essentially just referencing different models that have super strings or other drainage strings within the model database, and we give them a minimum vertical clearance. Uh, so in this case for the electricity, I want uh, 0.2 meters clearance, and versus my other drainage network, the SS network, I want 150 millimeters clearance or vertical separation from the model that I'm currently running. Now, if you can get your model names consistent, uh, then you can use the same service clash file from project to project. To activate that check, we simply hit separate details. And as I mentioned, it reports all of the service clash to the output window. So I'm just going to unauto hide or pin up that output window and just minimize this for now and just tuck it out of the way if I'm able. Okay, so within the output window, when you're running the service clash check, it will give you the service clash clearances that are okay, i.e. they're outside the limits that we specified in the service clash file. And it will also give us reporting where the service clash clearance is less than the limit. And it will isolate or report every drainage network and give you the pipe identification, uh, the change at which the clash occurs, what service it clashes with, 
and it gives you a bit of an idea of why it's being reported in the service clash check. Um, in this case, if I double click on this smart line, 12D will take me in plan and section view to where these clashes occur and it also gives me a little bit of a hint as to how to actually fix those. So if I just pop down into one of these, you can see visually as well as being reported in the output window where we have problems. I'll get one that's a little bit easy to identify and turn on those models. There we go. So we can see where those vertical clearance or those vertical separations are outside or inside the, the minimum tolerances that we specify. So that's an older option that you have inside the drainage network editor to start identifying these spatial conflicts, in this case just a vertical source. Now we also have the ability to do intersection checks. The intersecting, these can be the, um, these are used to check the intersection of two objects. Uh, one of the older options is the tin to tin intersection and this is consistently used to identify where you have a no cut or an interface between two tins. We've got the tri mesh to tin uh, option which produces super strings uh, in the shape of the daylighting of tri mesh objects and we have the tri mesh intersection where it identifies the locations of a penetration or a conflict of two, tri two different tri mesh objects. And I'll just demonstrate those live. This one is the tin to tin intersection. That's very okay, good. I'll also turn it on. Turn off the head wall. And this is found under the TINS TIN analysis option where you can identify the intersections of two different TINS. So I'm going to create a model called intersection TINS that's going to create some super strings where those two TINS intersect. If I calculate those three and turn on that new model intersection of TINS, I'll just toggle off the shade for now. You can see it's created things in 3D where those two tins intersect each other. So that's an old but a good option. Now we also have the option of under the tri meshes of finding a couple of intersections. We can do the intersection of lines by tri meshes in a tin. So so this is where the daylighting occurs, so I'm going to run an analysis or an intersection conflict between the SW pits that we converted from the drainage objects and the chamber that we created from the polygon. And I'm going to uh, identify where those conflict with the design tin and create a model intersection tri tins and the color is going to be yellow. So if I run that and turn on that new model that identifies where those intersections of the tri meshes and the tin occur. And turn on the SW pits. Okay. You'll see these pit locations location and it's created a model if I toggle off the shade of yellow lines where they intersect. Now firstly I'll turn off the pits. So you can see it's created 3D super strings where each element of that tri-mesh model intersect with the tin, so essentially where it daylights through. And if I turn off the chamber model, you can also see where that chamber, which was slightly higher than the tin level itself, um, daylights through the tin. Now the other option is producing or identifying where to tri meshes conflict. So we can do an intersection lines of tri meshes. So I'm going to take the design tin, which we gave depth to, and I'm going to see where that chamber actually penetrates the conflicts with that depth tin and create a model called intersection on tri mesh. 
just fly intersect that and go and turn on that new model that's produced. That actually produces 12B super strings where those two tri meshes actually intersect or conflict with one another. So that's pretty much a, a penetration of one tri mesh object with another tri mesh object. So we can have those intersection checks as it were. Now the one that's probably uh, going to be the most commonly used is the full 3D clash check between different 12 objects. So this is not only vertical but it's both a horizontal and a vertical clash check. It checks a 3D corridor um, based on rules of 12D string objects. It can check super strings, drainage, tri meshes in any variation, i.e. you can check super strings versus tri meshes or super strings versus drainage or any combination of all of those. Now these check routines are defined by rules and I'll show you how to set up and have a look where these rules are defined. And the rules are commonly defined via model names but they can be isolated or masked down to objects as well. So again, consistent model names is a tremendous advantage because once you set up your rule sets, you can apply these rule sets across different projects and we'll take you through some of the easiest. So these can be simple or comprehensive um, for corridor definition. It's completely up to you as the user how you set these all. Okay, back into 12D for hopefully the last time. And we'll show you where these 3D clash check analysis is run and accessed from. It's under Utilities, A to G, Check Clash, and we have an option here called Clash Detection. So before you run the detection, you need to define or set up your 3D Clash rules. So if I go into Rules here, we have rules that are already prepared inside um, 12B, and if I just run through that second page of the PowerPoint slide, these are defined and saved in a file that's in your user folder or in, uh, there's an example loaded with 12B, it's called serviceclashrules.xml and that's read on the project startup. And the file can be saved to the user or the project specific areas as is common with most 12D. Right, so, um, you can, all rules have uh, titles or descriptions and you can have multiple checks under there. I'm just going to set up a very, very simple one. Um, now I do highly encourage you to click on the help button when you come to a lot of options inside 12D. So I'm just going to fire up the help and we'll have a look at this in a minute. But it's going to open up the new PDF help inside 12D version 12 and it'll take you to the help. Okay, so I'm going to set up a new rule set. So if I come into here and I click on a new rule set, I'm going to create one called Drainage Simple. So that's an overall set of rules and you can give a good, uh, a good description there for um, I guess your QA purposes. And underneath the rule set you can set up different rules and it must have at least one rule. I'm going to call this one Drainage Simple. And you can give it a description and you can check one data set with another data set. So I'm going to do something very simple. I'm just going to go and check any model within the data set that I specify that has the model name with the uh, starting with SW. If you want to narrow that down to particular um, objects with a particular name mask within that model, you can do so under the object names to check. And I'm going to check this first data set, SW, with any model that starts with SS and we can give it some colours in there. So I'm going to set a purple colour for my checking corridor and I'm going to set a yellow colour for my corridor colours for my checking against data set. And you can be really quite detailed when it comes to the clearances. I'm going to start off very, very simple. Um, I'm going to put a combined horizontal clearance of 0 0.2. So in horizontal plan, I need to have that um, 200 mils clearance within the corridor. But you can do a left clearance or a right clearance or a cap clearance end. And um, I'm going to put in a combined vertical clearance of 0 0.2 as well. And when it comes to drainage strings, you can obviously put bottom and pit fronts and pit backs and that's all defined a little later on. Now it is a file that's read on startup, so 
I do need to write that file back and I'm just going to write it back to my project folder. And we do need to do a restart of 12D to read that XML file. So if I'm just going to do a restart, and in the meantime, you uh, to identify you to this PDF help on the detection rules. It's very, very detailed and very comprehensive, and it allows you to um, explain uh, all of these different top left, make that a little bit bigger. But there's a very excellent chapter under there. Okay, which details exactly what 12D checks against data set, data set A, B, and C, and what the rules do for go. And there's also a nice little section there on help file, all within a reference manual, and it's under chapter 30 under utilities. Okay, so my 12 is restarted, and I'm just going to run this first initial simple clash check, and I'm going to check it against those two models. Clash drainage. So I have two models inside this view, um, model starting with SS and model starting with SW, and I'm going to go ahead and run a 3D clash analysis on those. So I've set up my rules. And then I can go into the detection mode and fill all those out. I've got a few to do, so I'm going to read those via layout files. Okay, so layout and put, and I'll do the um, drainage. Simple. And so I'm going to check everything in this view, clash drainage, and I'm going to use the rule set. So any rule set that you've defined, We've got this one called Drainage Simple, um, and it can create a number of models. So it can create a models of the corridors of the data that you're checking, the data set up. Hey, it can create a model for corridors of the data that you're checking against, in this case, which was the SS models, and it can create some meshes, and we'll see what those do. It'll create a, a PDF report of all of the um, conflicts or all of the clashes. And if I just go and run that check against the data in this view, it's reported that out to a PDF file. So we'll look at the PDF file to start off with, and if I open that up. Let me get the background here. Okay, we've got a clash detection report, and each um, subset within the rule set will be um, numbered, and it'll show you whether there's any 3D clash results through there. So if I start off with the drainage simple, it tells me what the data I'm checking and the data I'm checking against. The values within the rule set for the clearance values, and it'll give me a um, indication of where I have objects within those rule sets that have a clash or a spatial conflict, and an X and a Y and a Z location. So this is fantastic for your reporting or your historical reporting that you've undertaken for your um, I guess your BIM analysis and your BIM workflow, but it's a little easier when you're looking at a dynamic inside 12D. Oh, I just close. There's all of those tabs and flip back into 12D. So not only does it create those clashes inside the output window. Now we've created a couple of models. So if I turn on those first two models, so the checking data set A, and it creates a model of strings that defines the corridors basically set up on that rule set. And it also creates a model for the against. And you can see with regards to the drainage strings, it's produced those where there's a um, conflict or a clash. And under the output window, if I just zoom in a little bit more, you see quite clearly I've got a, uh, a clash there, but I can identify and flip through those within the output window. And as I click on these in the output window, the smart lines, so that will automatically make those clashes occur. It creates a third model, which is a tri-mesh shape, which is the exact shape of those 3D clash areas so far. I turn on that last model, and I'll turn off the actual underlying drainage models. 
you can see the resulting trimesh shape that it produces, which is the shape of the conflict of those two um, corridors. I'll just turn off the shade for a second, and we'll start looking through those different areas and those different shapes. And this was just a very quick, simple rule set that we had a combined horizontal clearance and a combined vertical clearance, and we can run that 3D clash analysis. So you can be as simple or as complex as you want. It can check super strings versus drainage or super strings versus trimesh or any combinations of those. So what I'm going to do, uh, we set up that trimesh that we created from the tin. And our trimesh clash, and turn on that trimesh that we created from the tin. Tin design. And we're going to do a analysis of all of our stormwater elements and our trimesh tin. And I'll just get that underneath which will make life a little bit easier. So this is a really uh, quick and easy way to determine whether your drainage network is actually producing the minimum cover required. So I'm going to run out layout, another layout file, and I'm just going to check the depths. Okay, so I have a clash rule inside here. trimeshes. So this is going to run this rule here, which is checking everything in the SW model uh, versus anything in the trimesh model, and we've got a combined horizontal and vertical clearance from those depths. So if I run the check on that one, again it's created, it'll, it'll create a PDF report on those clashes and the clash detection, and it'll report it in the outside window, output window. So I have 58 potential complex here spatially, and it'll define, based on the um, data set checking, whether it's the pipe or the pit. Obviously all of the pits, I'm going to have a majority of those, because those pits themselves are going to be penetrating through that 600 mil deep trimesh, probably the actual complex. We can very quickly flick through those and see where our pipes are actually not uh, within our minimum depth scenario. So that's checking the drainage strings versus a trimesh itself. And another one of those um, can be used for your complex IFC data or your federated model. So I have a couple of models set up here, a, uh, those foundations from the model that we saw from the IFC data, and I have a drainage string. And what I'd like to do is, rather than just do a simple combined clearance, I want something a little bit more detailed. So within these class detection rules, under my checking trim, I have a SS versus trimesh, and so I'm going to check everything in my drainage SS models, and I'm going to check it versus anything in the footing models, i.e. these trimeshes, but I'm going to be a little bit more detailed. Um, I definitively want um, a top clearance and a bottom clearance from all of the drainage elements, and for the pits as well. So if I go and run that, okay, I'm going to check everything in this clash footing. Uh, the trimesh rule set, and it's going to create another set of models that I can check. So if I turn on that set of models that it's created, You can see rather than just one generic, it's got different values um, for above and below. And again, it's reported those 3D spatial clashes inside the output window and, and in a PDF report file. And if I flick through those, that's where my drainage with my IFC footings model. And if I turn on the corresponding trimesh there, so for visual or easy visual identification, and turn off the footings model. Okay. You can see where those clash corridors clash or intercept with the footings model. And then once you want to get into something, you can 
but one rule set that has every possible potential 3D clash evaluation or check that you want. Um, we've got one there called All Services uh, that checks the water versus the gas and the stormwater versus the sanitary sewer. So setting up these rules in the first place, having them saved back to a configuration file or a file on the user that you can use over and over again. And if you can get your model name it's consistent then you can run these checks over and over again so I'm going to do one final clash check which is going to check basically all of my services everything in this view things and I've got my electricity and I've got the gas it's going to go through all of these combined top bottom pit front pit back clash checks one last layout file So I'm going to check everything in the all services using the all services rule set. I'm going to create three check models and a report file and run check. And so you can see within the output window and within the PDF report file if I open that up. It's very quickly done a comprehensive supplements within those particular models within the particular rule sets. And if I look at the Asper's electricity and profile those around, and maybe my water versus electricity. So this is rather than checking drainage strings, this is checking super strings that have a mass or a size defined, either a culvert width and a height or a diameter, versus other coral models. Turn on the corresponding check models within those coral models. So hopefully this has given you an indication on some of the features and the functionality inside 12B that allow you to um, do spatial analysis or spatial conflict analysis. And I will pass back to Lisa for any questions that may. Thank you. Um, I think we've yeah we've got time for a couple of questions. So um, Martin in Sydney said, "Is there a way to create parametric trimeshes that will automatically size pits and headwalls, etc., based on pipes, like the size and arrangement of pipes?" I think. So create them based on the size of pipes. Um, the pipes would be defined via the drainage network, so we don't link parametric objects to pipes as such. Uh, we have routines that have uh, essentially um, pipe structures where maybe head walls and chambers, uh, but at the stage I don't think there's any automated way apart from converting those drainage objects, because generally when you're doing a drainage network and you've got the pipes and the pipe sizes because with the dynamic drainage you've got all sorts of different pipe sizes and shapes um, and that can be easily converted through from the 12D objects. Sure, okay. So, and um, Himachu in India said, um, sorry I'm just scrolling up, <laughs> um, sure. a lot of questions there actually. Uh, if we, as we can create trimeshes from tins, can we create yes tins from trimeshes? Yes and no. The thing with the trimesh, um, the trimesh doesn't have really any limitations. A tin limitation is it can only be a planar surface and that planar surface can't actually um, fold back on itself, whereas with a trimesh um, it can. So the, yeah, a trimesh is a much more complex object. So we don't have a convert to tins as such, but we do have the options within 12D to contour and label trimeshes or just to contour trimeshes, which I would say would probably be the easiest way of um, then creating some data that 12D can actually tin and where a trimesh folds back on itself, if it um, shares the same X, Y and Z or has a vertical plane, then you'd pick that up in the tin creation. So it's easier to convert um, a simpler object into a complex object rather than the complex back to the tin, but there is functionality within 12D that will create um, a data set or, or strings that you can then triangulate for a conventional tin. Okay, and um, Kieran in Perth said, 
Is there a way to output the distance between the models, for instance, the cover between a pipe and the ground surface into the PDF file? Sorry, can you just repeat that? Sure. Uh, is there a way to output the distance between the models, uh, for example, the cover between a pipe and the ground surface um, into a PDF? So doing the uh, the actual distance value itself. Well, I th probably a few ways to do that. I'd, I'd have to get my head around it. But if you've got the elements itself, um, let's say you've got your corridor strings to your tin, then you can um, take some of those corridor strings, or possibly even the tri mesh, and report a. Um, an X and a Y and possibly a difference in Z. So yes, I'm sure it could be done. I'll just have to think, think about it a little bit, but there's lots of functions in 12D where you can report out the, the elevation differences between essentially two strings. Sure. I'll be emailing you through these questions afterwards as well, so if you have anything to expand on, um, you can be emailing people back as well. Absolutely. Um, and. Um, just take a couple more at the moment. So Fung in uh, Queensland has said, for stormwater pipes, are clashing trimeshes created with internal diameter or external diameter? They would be the external diameter and the trimeshes are based on that external diameter and your um, separations that you specify to create the corridor models. So the trimesh is created from the extents of the corridor models with the other trimesh. So it would be the be the external, the greatest possible value on the on the drainage. Okay, and um, Kelly in New South Wales has said, is there a way to output the location of the clash in reference to the chainage of a control string? Yes, there would be um, because you should be able to do a uh, file data output an XYZ chainage offset which takes or creates a report, let's say a CSV report based on a reference string chainage and an offset to another element. So yes it would be or using the conventional um, XYZ chainage offset which is a very very flexible um, output data format where you can specify um, or oh, any number of things, um, the X, Y, Z of the reference string, the X and Y and Z of the string uh, that is within that corridor and the offset value to those other strings. Sure. And um, we're quite close to time so I'm just going to read out one more. Um, sure. Ben in Brisbane asked, does 12D run training courses on this stuff, so the, the clash detection and the trimeshes and stuff I guess? Yeah, yeah, we do actually. Um, we've introduced two new training courses this year that you've probably seen in the Dirt Dagger and the correspondence has come through from um, 12D. So we've got a, uh, a BIM training course, which is a one-day training course, which is essentially the exact same data set that I've got here, running a lot of the same functionalities, plus a little bit more in depth, obviously, because it's run over eight hours. And with regards to the dynamic um, tri-mesh creation for the roads, we've got the masterclass, which takes you you through the pavement attributes and attributes by snippets and I think um, we're going to discuss training courses here a little later on. Uh, I'm just not sure whether they're already programmed in or whether this is time for them but I do highly encourage you to get a hold of your local trainer and ask about those two new courses that we're putting on and started in 2018. Absolutely. Well thank you Dylan and thanks to the audience for your questions. Sorry to anyone whose questions we couldn't get to live today but we'll um, certainly be answering you by email very soon. Um, as Dylan touched on we've, we've got some great training courses coming up in Brisbane, Darwin, Melbourne, Perth and quite a few other locations if you have a look online um, and keep an eye on our social media always. We've got the handout available on this webinar to outline what's in some of the courses and you can register through the training page or um, contact us by email for more information. And don't forget our 12D Technical Forum is on in Brisbane this July. It's going to be a pretty huge event so jump online and register for that if you haven't already. We've got loads of people coming along and um, lots of exciting topics to cover.
The recording of today's webinar will be available in coming days through our website and our YouTube channel. Our next two training webinars are Survey Coding 12D Field Pickup on the 10th of July and Dealing with Assets that Don't Fit into ADAC on the 15th of August. We've also got some great industry solutions topics um, happening there in the schedule too, so feel free to sign up for those and many more through our website. We'll keep you posted on all of that through email and social media if you're subscribed. And if you need to contact us in the meantime, our details are on the screen now. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you all for attending and we hope to see you at future webinars.